you guys are probably aware, or maybe not, uh, the states of California and New York have uh, signed laws or executive orders to basically enforce that people stay home, right? So they're trying to try not trying to slow the spread so that our hospitals and other medical facilities aren't overwhelmed uh, as people get sick. So, so here uh, we see that a tweet from the governor of New York and a picture of the governor of California. And, uh, you know, New York's saying that they're going to enforce this, right? They're basically, they're going to fine anybody who comes outside of their home unless, you know, they're in the pharmaceutical or grocery or, or other, um, you know, needed industry right now. So uh, that kind of reminded me of that classic movie, Judge Dredd, uh, you know, just kind of a futuristic type society. So, you know, what's the future going to be like? It's going to be like a dystopia type Mad Max scenario. I mean, probably not, right? But I mean, it is going to be a lot, you know, at least for the near term, it's going to be a lot more isolated, right? And really right now, I don't think, you know, anybody knows how long this is going to last. So, so there's some predictions out there on it, but, uh, you know, it could be longer or shorter than what people are thinking right now. Right, so right now, social distancing, I'm sure you've all heard about that in the media, right? Um, you know, what does that really mean? You know, it means like virtual meetings like this and remote work, that all starts to become the new norm, right? Um, instead of you being that weird person who works remote at a company where everybody else is at the corporate headquarters, now nobody's gonna come, nobody's coming to the whole corporate headquarters because, um, because of the spread, right? So, and uh, I, uh, you know, and so I just feel like companies, uh, maybe if you work in the tech industry, you know, remote work was already commonplace for your company or your industry, but you know, there's a lot of other industries where, I mean, they maybe didn't even have VPN solutions or other ways of uh, doing secure remote access until recently, right? So, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, Industries have been around a lot longer that uh, that uh, are going to have to adopt to this type of model, at least for the near term, right? So, so and instead of just some employees being remote, it's pretty much everyone's remote, right? I mean, I've personally been on con so many conference calls this last week, and uh, because schools are closed pretty much across the nation, uh, you know, it's just the norm. Like everyone's kids are jumping up in the background and waving and. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're in like pretty serious business calls, right? So it's just, uh, you know, something that I think, you know, we'll probably, you know, we'll get used to more and, you know, families will try to, you know, adopt to the scenario more. So, yeah, so, yeah, and I, I agree, man. I, I, I definitely, you know, like my space, I like I have like the Bryce bubble, right? I don't like people coming too close to me. I'm not really like a huge, hugger if some of you know me or seen me at conferences before uh so you know it's not it's not too bad for me but um you know for most people i think this is pretty um pretty inconvenient for them at this point all right so how does this whole like scenario apply to cybersecurity? right like we can talk all day about the current state you know i, I mean i'm just kind of telling you what i've seen in the news and what i've researched every day i look on my phone for articles about you know c19 and how it's affecting society just because more i want to like see where the trends are going and it seems like speculations are pretty wide right between like people saying oh this is going to blow over in a couple weeks to other people saying like this is going to be like a year and a half thing right so um so it'll it'll be interesting but regardless i mean for the now where people can't even go to work, I mean, they're gonna need some way to securely do remote work, right? So, you know, that could be something as simple as like, you know, VPNs deployed at their work with their machines still running so they can, you know, hit the VPN and then RDP into their boxes or to something much more advanced, right? So, so I think, you know, this, this type of services are definitely gonna go up, right? And so security around remote access and whatnot, like as security, cybersecurity professionals or people who are interested in the industry, in general, you know, we're going to have to, uh, you know, put more scrutiny here. Not that, not that there hasn't been a lot of scrutiny here in the past, right? Because, um, you know, if you had remote access, you wanted to make sure it's secure. Because generally, you know, you have this nice hard shell on the outside of your corporation and your protected networks. And uh, the way to get through that is the VPN. 
But then once you get through there, you have that nice, delicious inside. It's like like an M and M, right? Hard, hard candy outside with like delicious soft chocolate on the inside. So if an attacker could get a foothold on the inside, a lot of times they could just move on un, uh, unrestricted across of it, right? Um, I don't know how many environments that I've personally pen tested where I've seen basically a flat network design, right? Where all systems, workstations, production, everything are just all inside the corporate network. And obviously that's not recommended, um, but uh, you know, companies that are startups or are really focused on growth or haven't really had an IT background or cybersecurity background, um, you know, maybe you know, they just had a friend start their IT systems and they really didn't design it from the ground up the way they should have. So, so you know, what's gonna happen, right? If people aren't coming into offices, that means they're not inside that hard perimeter, right? But, you know, they still got data and they still gotta do work, right? And, you know, uh, businesses are gonna fight to stay alive, right? Businesses don't wanna, they don't wanna go out of business. I mean, people have sunk a lot of time and money into, uh, into these entities and they want them to continue to thrive, right? So they're just gonna get work done any way they can. And I think that's gonna be a lot more of work occurring on like not corporate owned devices or a lot more work occurring just on whatever you can get your hands on, right? Which means, uh, you know, there's gonna be more and more breaches outside of this perimeter. And if we don't come up with a good way to get visibility into those endpoints or uh, protections around like bring your own device and other type policies, uh, you know, that's going to be a huge problem. And it, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, you know, obviously companies could still, you know, mail equipment to employees, but you know, if you're trying to make a decision between buying new laptops and making payroll, like obviously you're going to do payroll and tell people to use their own computers. Right. So, so I mean, businesses, I mean, it, a lot of businesses, especially small businesses are going to be really hurt by the, the market downturn. Right. So. So, you know, personally, I think zero trust, I mean, this is, this is gonna be the way of the future, man. I mean, a lot of companies have already started implementing this and, you know, implementations versus, versus different companies widely vary, right? So just saying, because you do zero trust, that may, that may be great or it may be useless, right? Depending on your implementation. So, so I think, you know, the real thing here is with zero trust des design, you're basically, you know, you're going to authenticate who the user is that's sitting at the device. And then you're also going to authenticate the device, say like, hey, does this device good to uh, act, like access our corporate resources? And, uh, you know, that could be like, you know, is this device owned by us? Or that could be like, does this device just like meet our requirements? Like, does it have antivirus on it? You know, has it been patched? Things like that. You know, and if you haven't met those requirements, you, you can't verify who you are or the device doesn't meet the corporate policies, then um, then zero trust just basically says like, hey, you can't you can't talk to anything in our enterprise, right? Um, but if you do, then the zero trust systems will enable you to talk just to the systems that you're allowed to talk to, the systems that are inside your kind of like group, right? So. And then another nice thing about this is uh, you kind of have these central points where you can audit who who is accessing what systems from which devices. So, um, you know, that's a lot, lot better than a, a flat network for multiple reasons, right? Um, you know, if one workstation gets compromised in a flat network, generally attackers will try and move laterally onto, you know, other workstations, right? Until they find a workstation that has, you know, someone doing admin tasks inside the network. Um, right in a zero trust network, you can really only talk to the applications that you're allowed to talk to, which means you can't really talk to any other um, workstations, ideally. And if you can't talk to other workstations, then that makes attackers life a lot, a lot more difficult because they have to find a vulnerability in the applications you're talking to and then wait for other user, users to log into those applications. And then they have to have a capability then to move downstream from those compromised applications to other workstations and then kind of like move up and down. Um, that's, that's a lot more complex, right? So, and, and, a, and a, lot, a lot of attackers are not trained on that. Um, you don't see, you know, a lot of uh, hacking groups or even red teams or pen testers um, really taking the time or effort to go through that work. Um, you know, you might see it in limited scenarios, um, but, uh, you know, that might be something also to watch. It's just kind of the way that attackers are going to try and move through the networks more and more in the future, right? 
Um, you could definitely, you know, get a zero trust type uh, system going low cost, you know, by implementing, uh, well, you get some of the features by implementing host-based firewalls across your enterprise, you know, just even something as simple as, you know, making sure that uh, hosts can't talk to other hosts' SMB services on like, you know, port 445, um, then uh, you know, that can be quite effective where you have maybe like a, a CIDR block that can talk out where the admins reside and, um, and everybody else can't talk to each other. Um, because that just makes lateral movement that much harder on the, on the attacker side. So, um, yeah, I, um, yeah. So, I mean, zero trust is a big thing. It was really, I, I think pioneered at, uh, Google, uh, they have a big write up on it. And now, uh, there's several vendors that have taken it and commoditized, commoditized it. So to make it easier to implement at your organization, I, you know, I don't have a specific vendor recommendation, but uh, I definitely think, you know, as more and more people turn to remote work and just honestly, this is something that we should have, we should have been doing a long time ago to make the inside of the M&M &M a lot, a lot harder. Right. So um, in addition, right, you know, if you're not really going to the office anymore, you're probably not going to really care if your servers are at the office. Right. So I, I feel like, and this is already kind of a trend, you know, there's going to be more and more focus on cloud security. Um, the border that used to exist because people are going into office spaces and you could have site to site VPNs between offices and all that stuff. You know, that's, that's really going to diminish even more now that people, more people are doing remote work and whatnot. I mean, sure you can force everyone to VPN into to the corporate LAN and things like that, but, um, but uh, seems far more effective to have your systems built around a, a cloud security model. I mean, there's, there's some pros to the cloud security model. Um, one of them that I like is uh, things are a lot more audible. Like there's an API you can call to find out what, where, uh, how many servers you have, right? Um, or, you know, how many files you have in S3 buckets and things like that. Things that are typically quite hard to figure out in a, in a traditional data center model where People install devices in data centers. Uh, they're supposed to be tracked in some type of asset tracking system. And everyone who's in this industry and does it long enough knows for the most part, those asset tracking systems are, are pretty inaccurate, right? So, um, you know, if people try and create like a master CMDB of their, uh, their assets in their enterprise, but uh, I feel like that's still executed very, very poorly. Um, you know, one of the downsides of cloud accounts is just if there's cloud accounts sitting out there that you don't know about, obviously if you don't know about them, you can't monitor them, you can't enable auditing and logging and all that. Um, and uh, another, another downfall of cloud is a lot of people think like, I'm gonna push all my resources to cloud, so I don't gotta worry about that. That's, uh, that's Microsoft's problem or that's Amazon's problem. And in reality, the bulk of the security work still sits, sits on your shoulders, right? So. The way that you configure the policies and roles and permissions in your cloud providers is mission critical. I mean, I don't know if you guys have looked for, uh, you know, cloud storage breaches on on Google search or like uh, S3 storage bucket breaches, but it feels like every month there's like a major breach, right? Like, like Time Warner Cable, DGI, the Army, Accenture. I mean, they all left tons of files and uh, in storage accounts on these cloud providers that were just open to anybody on the internet. Anybody on the internet could have gone and downloaded them. Um, there is a project, it's uh, called Gray Hat Warfare, where he's, this guy has actually gone and indexed all the files which he can find in public uh, storage accounts on Amazon so you can search them in real time. So it's kind of like a showdown, but even more intrusive because you're like searching people's files or file names and then you could go pull the contents, right? So I don't know, that's like kind of questionable ethics, right? I don't know where that lies. I mean, definitely when you start accessing someone else's data, you don't have authorization to access, even if there's no restrictions placed on it. I feel like that's illegal, but I'm not an attorney, so don't take legal advice from me. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy, right? But the, this is the new new, right? I mean, I mean, data centers are pretty expensive to run. Um, and, uh, you know, it made some sense when you already had the connections and, and facilities set up, but as more and more of these office spaces, if they go away or 
uh, you know, we move more to remote work, definitely these cloud services are just going to become very standard in our industry. All right, so, you know, here's the other thing that I was kind of thinking when I was like, thinking up like, hey, if like everyone moves to remote work and we stay away from each other all the time, which sounds fabulous to me, uh, like, uh, let's, uh, you know, what, what are attackers gonna do? How are they gonna change how they're gonna come after our infrastructure? And, uh, you know, one thing that I think is gonna get even more prevalent, I mean, this is already popular now among attackers, but, uh, you know, it, if I'm pushing all my stuff to cloud and I have zero trust, um, you know, going after your corporate land and all that, that that's going to be hard, man. I mean, it's just going to be, I mean, it's not like it's not po possible in a zero trust model, but it's just, it's, it's a pain. So uh, an easier way would be, hey, if you as a company trust another company, because almost every company out there has vendors, they need, they need something to do their job, right? And then a lot of those vendors have uh, higher privilege access inside of their environments because they need to be able to talk to their other systems and they need to be able to put orders in or um, make requests, things like that. Um, so, you know, I think we're going to see more and more actors target these third party vendors. At, even though they don't maybe don't care about those vendors, they really want who those vendors provide services to. Um, there's been a lot of reports lately about uh, MSPs, uh, like managed service providers, being compromised and allegedly by you know nation state governments and then they're using that as initial access into the msp's clients right like the msp's that they're monitoring for either availability or security concerns have an agent and then that the third party uh, msp provider is able to monitor and fix problems on those endpoints and so the attackers go after the msp because once they get access to one msp they can access a multitude of target environments and maybe they don't care about all those but maybe they care about one or two and so for them that's good value so I'm just calling this deep phishing, right? Because uh, I'm trying to come up with a term, right? And uh, you know, this this is not like a theoretical, right? This is this has been done, right? And it's, it's probably being done right as we speak. So, uh, for example, the the whole target scenario, right? The way that they got a foothold into target systems is that they went after uh, basically a vendor or supplier for target, right? They fished onto that guy's laptop. They got his creds and they used his creds to as as initial uh, access point to start talking to target systems directly and then they were able to you know gain access to those systems by chaining together a series of vulnerabilities which then allowed them to pivot around the network and eventually get to the point of sale terminals where they started stealing credit card numbers at all of targets locations um, you know and they, they stole the data and the credit card numbers and all that stuff right so so i mean you know this is not might happen this is is happening and will probably dramatically go up if things continue down the same path. So I think, you know, one thing that we're probably already experiencing right now is as we're sitting at home, because we're forced to be home, we're just, we're gonna start using the internet more, right? I mean, if your boss or coworker isn't sitting right next to you, I mean, there's a lot of employees that are gonna just open up Netflix or whatever and start watching stuff from their house while they're working. And not saying anything bad about that, just saying, you know, that that's more bandwidth, right? And, uh, you know, the more we're forced to be at home, the more we're forced to use the internet to interact with each other. And the more we use the internet, um, yeah, the, the more traffic that goes across it. Um, large tech companies, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, AWS, Azure, um, they've, they've, they've already invested heavily in these undersea cables, right? These fiber optic cables to connect their uh, data centers around the globe so that they can provide the, the best experience to the users on their platforms. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to see significantly more um, internet infrastructure go down in the next few years, just due to demand uh, for remote work and, and bandwidth requirements. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see whether the last mile, like the internet providers to us actually step up or not, um, you know, but the, you know, these major tech companies, they, they need these type of services to continue to provide, uh, you know, continue to be competitive in the space. So, so I think that's cool. I mean, that, you know, that's, that's a better internet ecosystem for all of us, right? Um, but, you know, with that, I, I really think that there's going to be even more of a push for end-to-end -end encryption, right? I mean, the more cables that go down, um, the harder it is to monitor the cables, to uh, know what's going on at all your different locations. And, you know, companies like in the tech industry, like Facebook, have, have been preaching for a while now that, you know, you basically, you need to do 
end-to-end -end encryption everywhere, like even inside of your private networks in your data centers, from application to application inside your own data centers, you need to be encrypting it. And that, and that is what, as far as my understanding, my knowledge base is what Facebook does right now, is they encrypt all the transmissions even inside their data centers. So even if someone were to compromise one of these fiber optic cables, or they were to compromise a switch or a router in a data center, um, they theoretically would be unable to read the communications because they're encrypted even inside their own private networks. So I think that's pretty cool. And I also think the push to cloud is really enabling this. I mean, the cloud providers basically enable TLS automatically because they assume that you're gonna access them over the internet, which is not trusted, but you don't have to. I mean, there's ways to set up AWS accounts that are completely private so that none of the services that you're using can ever talk to the internet. Um, you can drop endpoints inside of virtual private um, networks in AWS and uh, you, yeah, you can set up a lot of those services now so they never talk out to the internet, right? But you still, I mean, that's inside AWS's data center. So you still want, what if a router switch is compromised in their data center, right? You want that to still be encrypted and a lot of those service providers are now doing that by default. So I think you'll see more and more push for this. Uh, you know, I know some of the major tech companies are doing this now, but not all big tech companies are doing it. Um, just really the ones that uh, are trying to be a little more proactive. So hopefully, you know, everybody just does this by default going forward. So, or everyone gets on the cloud providers and the cloud providers are just kind of doing that transparently um, underneath, right, for you. All right, so, uh, yeah, deep fakes. Deep fakes are scary, man, right? Because, you know, at least right now or previously, you know, if something was a fake, um, you know, journalists would, would really be to be all over that. I mean, up until lately, we've still had press conferences with the president and journalists were invited to be there. Um, you know, we're kind of going into, a, an, at least for me, an unknown territory here. Um, the, the, you know, if we can't meet with people in real life, um, there's really no journalist or anyone to fact check that someone said or did something, right? And uh, if somebody's able to create videos and to the point in which we can't detect that they're fakes, I mean, you know, they could potentially shape um, world events. So for example, I mean, it's widely considered to be a fact now that, you know, foreign governments were meddling in our previous election, right? And I mean, my understanding of reading the unclassified reports about this is that, you know, Russia basically wanted to sway the public. And so they used the ad networks and fake accounts on providers like Facebook and Twitter and things like that to try and push certain narratives. And they thought the net effect of pushing those narratives would be that, you know, you would vote more for one candidate versus another candidate. So thinking about this again, we've got an election theoretically coming up in 2020 if it doesn't get postponed or whatever they're going to do, right? And, um, you know, what if Russia produces deep fake videos that we can't, using technology, we can't verify are fake, uh, and then just starts releasing those on social media, um, which starts swaying the public one way or another, right? I mean, that's a pretty, um, you know, maybe we have the technology to detect those fakes now, but, you know, um, Technology has a way of, of, of leapfrogging to, uh, in a way that, uh, you know, improving in leaps, right? So, so you know, it, it's possible. Is it probable? I don't know. But, uh, but, you know, without people being at press conferences or being able to, to fact check with people in real life, I mean, that definitely makes, you know, trying to manipulate public opinion uh, like a whole new level. Um, so, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting see what happens here. I mean, there's definitely, you know, incentive, right, for foreign governments to meddle with other governments' elections, right? So. All right. Um, okay, great. So, you know, I, I think one thing that might be positive is, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have VR sets, virtual reality sets, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, if people start to lack the human interactions, right? I mean, this is an alternative that they could go to uh, with little risk, 
right? Uh, without the risk of catching the virus or anything like that, you know, as long as you're not sharing headsets or something with people, unknown people. But, uh, but uh, you know, this could be a real boon to this industry. I mean, the VR industry is, in my opinion, pretty cool. Uh, it's, uh, but you know, it's still, you know, pretty enthusiast, enthusi enthusiast space, right? Like people who want to be into it are into it. You know, that, you know, we could see like a much wider, especially if like the virus were to linger for like a year and a half or something like some people are predicting. I mean, you could see a much, you could see a boom in VR. I mean, right now, you know, you could go get theoretically like an Oculus Quest and you don't even need a computer to hook it up and uh, you can do room space based VR. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, you know, you don't even need a good computer, right, to run it. It's all self-contained in the headset, and uh, you don't even need sensors on the walls or anything fancy. You just plop this thing on, pick up the controllers, and you're good to go. So, I mean, we could see that stuff start to boom, right? And, you know, I know there's some, like, applications on the platforms right now to do social interaction. I've looked at them quite a bit. Um, you know, I'd still say they're pretty basic, right? Um, you know, there's some VR chat room, like, experiences that are, uh, um, you know, people like, but you know, they're still pretty, in my opinion, rudimentary. So you could see a lot more app dev uh, time being put on those to provide people with a much better like experience, right? Um, so instead of this just going from an enthusiast market that people think is gonna be a thing in the future, you know, it could be a thing almost now, right? So, um, right, so then I was thinking like, VR takes off, right, theoretically, because people can't go outside for like a year or something like that. I mean, that's, you know, probably a worst case scenario, but I was just, you know, to go with that scenario. So, so I was trying to think like, hey, what's the implications here, right? And like the, the thing that I, you know, you're going to have all these guys developing VR apps, right, for this platform if it takes off. And, um, you know, historically, uh, I think that's going to be a, a lot of the same resources that have done video game programming in the past. And, um, you know, video game programming in the past is not, um, it's been very emphasis on features and performance. And uh, there hasn't been a, like a huge emphasis on security, right? Um, so at least from my perspective, there has not. So like, for example, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, several vulnerabilities have been discovered in video games like a lot of the games on Steam that are produced by Valve that used to use or still use the Source engine, like CSGO uses it, and I believe Team Fortress 2 uses it and all that. And, uh, you know, I think there was a period of time where, um, for like, I don't know, like, let's see, you know, like for about five years where um, there was a, a particular spray, you know, in those games, you go around and tag the walls, right? And if you tag the walls, uh, you know, you can have your team's logo and stuff like that on the walls, right? So, you know, you could kind of use that to mock the other team as you're winning or whatever. But for the period of five years, there was actually a vulnerability where if you built a very, like a, a malicious spray, you could spray the walls and basically crash everybody's clients except for your team's. If your team's clients don't crash and everybody else's does, you can go around and frag them. And eventually, a, a German researcher reported this vulnerability to uh, to Valve, and, and they fixed it across the platform. But uh, you know, I mean, I don't. I mean, there's things like that that I feel like the gaming industry has not really put a lot of uh, time and effort on the security end. So. So, uh, you know, what, what could this future look like? If, if they're gonna crank out a bunch of code, they're gonna crank it out fast and they haven't really been focused on security in the past, what's, what's that gonna look like in, in the future? Uh, you know, and, and one thing that I just kind of thought of was, you know, this, this could literally be, um, you know, uh, a, a whole new market, right? So I don't know if you guys are aware or not, but you know, there's companies out there right now and all they do is they buy zero day vulnerabilities or zero day exploits, right? And what, what is a zero day exploit? It's, a, it's an exploit that takes advantage of a vulnerability and a piece of software that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's not known by most people, right? It's known by you, but not really known by anybody else. So then you can sell that exploit to somebody else and that, and that usually gives them some type of capability, like let's some bypass authentication on an application or, gives them 
uh, remote code execution, which means they can execute whatever code they want on your system. And if they can execute whatever code they want on your system, they can steal all your files, or they can, you know, use your system to pivot to other systems, or they can, um, you know, I don't, you know, just generally do anything that you could do on, do on the system, right? So right now, you know, it's a pretty baby town for Alex if you want to develop exploits on gaming platforms. Uh, so it's, it's not that hard. <laughs> um, but, you know, if everyone starts using VR and VR is using a lot of the same code base that gaming software is using today, um, you know, the value of these exploits for the VR platforms could, could go high, right? And now, you know, one possible use case for this is, I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, Ghost in the Shell before or not, but there's a, there's a hacker in here called the Laughing Man. And uh, basically when you're, when you're Everyone in this basically futuristic society has enhancements, right? Like some part of your body is enhanced with technology. And so he uh, is such a good hacker that he's able to exploit weaknesses in, in those enhancements so that no one could ever see his face. So every time everyone tries to see his face, they just see this laughing man logo because he basically has O days for their, their enhancements, right? Um, so, you know, you could see something like that occur so that people could stay anonymous on those platforms. Um, you know, I mean, if everything's thrown, flowing through the internet and everybody's on, you know, one to two to three major chat platforms on VR, you know, you, chances are high, you know, criminals and others are going to jump on there, which means law enforcement's going to jump on there and start monitoring it, right? And, you know, there's always a sub demographic that wants to stay anonymous on a platform. So, um, you know, that's, that's one use case, you know, another use case is, you know, if people are actually able to develop exploits for those platforms, maybe they can even get remote code execution on your laptop or something like that. So it's like, Hey man, let's meet up on VR and chat. And when they do, you take advantage of vulnerability in the software and you're able to take control of their laptop, uh, without them knowing. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, um, just how uh, a remote work shift and how getting rid of a lot of uh, this old, um, you know, hard outside, soft inside type mentality would, uh, you know, would change us. But in the cybersecurity space, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of parts of society is maybe not for the better, right? But in the cybersecurity space, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that we should already be doing today. So even if like we all wake up tomorrow and like CDC is like pandemic's over, like we're all good, everybody go outside. I still feel like a, a lot of these recommendations here in these presentations are things we should be doing, like zero, zero, zero trust, cloud security, right? Those, those type things, end-to-end uh, -end encryption. I mean, those are things regardless of what the future holds. I mean, we should really be pushing organizations towards those type of solutions. And, and as cybersecurity professionals, uh, you know, if, if we, uh, we should be making these things dead easy for, for corporations to implement, right? I mean, one thing that is really annoying to me is just, you know, like a company, their, their goal is to um, stay in business, right? It's to like drive value to basically, you know, their clients and their shareholders and, and all that, right? And I feel like historically, a lot of cybersecurity professionals, they're, they're the no guy, right? They're kind of like the mom that goes around the organization. It's like, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. And, and really, as an industry, we need to shift from, no, you can't do that, to, yeah, you can totally do that. And here's how we do it in a way that is, you know, well-organized for you and well-organized for us as security professionals. Um, so, you know, we don't want to be the guys that are just telling people no. Uh, I, I do believe the push to cloud is, is from, you know, for most of commercial, it is inevitable, right? It's due, due to cost savings. Um, and, uh, but... Uh, the, you know, as security professionals, it's, it's on us to go learn those platforms, right? We can't just be like, hey, I know firewalls, I know VPNs, I've been doing this stuff for like the last decade. I'm not, I'm not gonna learn cloud. Like that's, like, I don't need to know how roles or access control works in cloud. Like that's, that's not, it's not gonna be a viable strategy in my opinion for the next 20 years, right? So um, as, as on-prem and data centers start to dwindle, um, that stuff's all gonna get migrated to cloud. As you know, startups. Most of the startups are training in cloud infrastructure just due to their um, their need to start cheap and small, and then scale up rapidly with their platforms. And um, you know, I, I do think the serverless uh, platforms that are on cloud right now are 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 okay for basic tasks like scripts that you want to automate. But you know, they're pretty hard for advanced uh, applications because it's 
it's hard to debug the code in serverless environments, especially if you have like multiple serverless components all talking to each other. It, it's hard to know uh, where things are failing. Um, at least from for me, when I when I'm developing things uh, for in Lambda and and those platforms. So I mean, I, I do think that there still needs to be a little more innovation and and ease of use in the in the serverless space. But I, I do think that's coming as well, right? So so uh, containers are kind of the new new and orchestration of them kubernetes is clearly the winner of that right now um which you know a lot of the cloud providers have very slick managed service for right now but uh you know after that push is over then i think a lot of people are going to turn to the serverless and hopefully it'll be mature enough by then that people will actually be able to debug complex applications in, in those ecosystems um so yeah so i think as security professionals we just really need to get ahead of the curve right we can't you know just keep saying no forever uh, we we got to be the guys that know the cloud. We got to know AWS, Azure, GCP. We got to know zero trust, right? We got to know how to take these old legacy lands and and easily get them into a more secure state. And and then we got to be innovating, right? Like it's it's not good enough for us to just say like like hey, you know, yeah, everyone just gets pwned by phishing, you know. And it's not good enough for us to say like you know, we just need to do more user training and awareness. Like that's, that's not a real solution, right? Like we need an actual solution that we can provide to the masses and be like, Hey, we know you guys get fished, install this solution. And you know, that mitigates 90% of the risk or something like that. Right. And you know, a lot of that work is still to be done. So that's, that's the great part about cybersecurity as a profession. And in my personal opinion is just that I me, mean, it's still a little wild, wild westy, right? There's still a lot of opportunity out there. And you know, while, it's horrible that we're all focused to stay inside. I mean, some people think that, right? Um, I mean, there's a real opportunity for us as cybersecurity professionals to try and try and push forward the industry, and um, yeah, and, and try and make this just a little bit better of a world than it was yesterday. So, so I, I just leave that with you guys at, at this time, and uh, we will. Uh, I think that's the last slide. Oh, thanks again to the sponsors. Really appreciate it, especially uh, DigiSir is so helpful every year and RSA and Adobe um, and uh, you know, Mindcast and Corelight came through this year and uh, Red Canary and SaltStack and even St. Con and uh, No Starch Crash and Redpoint Security pitched in as well. So I, I really appreciate all them um, and, and all they're doing for this event. So, so uh, with that, and I will post the slides that I just, uh, that I just, add on to Twitter. My Twitter name is Tweak Fox, and I'll put it in this chat. Um, also, uh, also uh, I will, um, these are being recorded and they should be up on YouTube um, relatively quickly after the event. So um, big thanks to, once again, to Pope uh, with Pope Tech. Uh, the, Really, this event would not be happening without Pope and, and, and the team, right, and his uh, media team. So I, I really want to thank them again. Um, they, you know, in a matter of basically a week, put this entire thing together from a tech staff. And, um, you know, hopefully we won't have any issues with recording and all that, and everything will be up pretty rapidly. So, all right. We will have the next session at uh, 2 p.m. It will begin. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll just get to answer these random questions in the channel uh, for a minute while we're waiting on that. So why is it called B-Sides? My, my understanding of why it's called B-Sides is because uh, if you guys remember tape decks, um, uh, they, they had two sides, right? So the primary side when you, when you had a tape and you put it in the tape deck to play music would be the A-side. But then a lot of artists realized uh, they could record another stream on the tape deck on the back side, and they'd call that the B side. Um, so that's kind of where the name came from. And I think the implementation there is really, um, you know, Black Hat in Las Vegas is, is a, I don't have anything bad to say about it. I think it's a great event, but uh, it's also very expensive, right? I mean, tickets are basically $2,000 a pop, which makes the event very inaccessible inaccessible to a lot of audiences, right? I mean, unless you have a corporate sponsor, you're probably not gonna pay $2,000 to go to Black Hat. 
And so, um, you know, some of the original organizers where B sides started in B sides Las Vegas, um, they they were just kind of like, hey, we need an alternative here that's low cost that everybody can go to, um, and so they created B sides um, LV or Las Vegas, and uh, you know that you know comes from the reference to the tape deck, right? So you know, A the A sides maybe Black Hat, and then the B side is their conference, the alternative that everybody can go to. So. Um, Yeah, so um, that's kind of where the term comes from. And then they kind of put together like a like an ethos, right? Of like, what is a B-Sides? And then the organizers at, in B-Sides San Francisco, which, which is one of the larger B-Sides events, uh, B-Sides Las Vegas and B-Sides San Francisco are pretty large. Um, they, uh, you know, got a trademark around the term and kind of put some legal framework in there. But uh, every B-Sides is its own legal entity. Uh, so like, we are, uh, and some of them go through the process of becoming a nonprofit. So besides Las Vegas, or no, besides Salt Lake City, we've, we've gone through the process of becoming a, a nonprofit. We're a 501c3. That's really thanks to the work of one of the board members, um, Ryan Simpkins. Uh, he, he basically single-handedly did that for us, which I completely, uh, I, 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 my hat's off to him. I owe him. And, uh, you know, he helps us make sure we're compliant with state and um, federal laws with, with the charity every year. So just know when you buy a ticket or, um, you know, you sponsor the conference or anything like that, your money is going to the nonprofit. Um, you know, I don't, you know, no, no one who spends their time and effort on the event makes money off the event. And then the only thing we do with the, the leftover funds is we use that to seed the next year's event. So, um, so, you know, my goal really is to make this a self-sustaining event, right? Where we have enough money to keep growing it every year. Um, you know, I, I could envision a future where, you know, you know, there's thousands of people at a B-Side Salt Lake City event, right? I mean, at a $20 price point, I don't think that's unreasonable at all. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about making this, making the event the way it's been, which is more small and intimate, um, which, you know, we're trying really hard to stay true to our values when we when we originally created this. And really, if you haven't heard my, I think my speech is recorded on YouTube on the channel from two years ago um, about like why we're doing this. But um, the real the reason that we're doing this is, you know, I don't know if you've seen in some of my emails, but the slogans by the people for the people. I mean, my goal really here is for uh, number one to get more people into cybersecurity. I um, really like to get more college kids coming out to the events and um, up to speed and, you know, just even if they like have a little interest, but they're not certain, uh, give them a platform to, to make some more connections in the community and, and kind of build their social network a bit more. And then two, if you're already in the community and your cybersecurity platform it, uh, uh, professional, this gives you a platform to give back to the community. So I really encourage people that are professionals like to submit for the workshops and the villages and the call for papers next year, especially if you're in Utah, um, because like, I, I just want, you know, more of the college kids to see and get to know, um, you know, professionals in the industry and, you know, kind of have uh, more of a vision like, hey, I, if I work hard, I could be like this guy or I could be like that guy. Um, you know, I could, you know, um, you know, I could be, you know, and in the process have fun. Like I could do some like RFID hacking or I can learn a bunch of cool content at these talks. And then, um, and then um, hopefully inspire them to, you know, go down, become cybersecurity professionals themselves. So, uh, and then hopefully, you know, uh, that grows the whole community across, you know, the world, right? So, so, you know, even if they don't stay in Utah, if they move to DC or anywhere else, um, then, you know, we're still doing our part to kind of at least help meet the cybersecurity gap a bit more and, and also, you know, one of the primary things here is is give back, right? So I think a lot of us who are in cybersecurity now and have, you know, the things that we have in life, um, we got here because somebody was willing to take the time out of their day to, uh, you know, to talk to us, right? I mean, I know personally when I was growing up, uh, I used to meet up with a bunch of hackers at, at a round table pizza uh, like every week, and we just talk about computer stuff, and uh, you know that that was pretty much the catalyst that gave me the the ability to get into this industry and to, uh, you know, hopefully make a positive impact. So, so, all right. So, 
Uh, I'm going to hand it off to the next speaker who will start in five, four minutes now. Uh, thank you guys. If you want to chat more, I am on Slack. I'm Bryce Coons on uh, the B sides. And um, if you guys need anything, feel free to email info at bsidesaltlakecity.org and someone on the team will get back to you. Thanks. Thanks, guys.